All right, I'm recording. <clears throat> this is just kind of looking around the heart. This feels weird, man, because you, you guys can't even see it. So I'm not getting into anything heavy yet. So here's the here's the heart that you could see, like the blood leaving the the um the pulmonary artery, and then it supplies the lungs, and then back through the pulmonary veins. Oh, I'm like. See, so I got my thing up here. Yeah, so I'm okay. I'm recording it too. Um, I mean, you guys could really be anywhere if you want. So don't feel like you have to stay, but you're you're welcome to. And then if you look at it from this way, it's coming up around the 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 pulmonary. I'm sorry, the aorta, and then it's descending and it's feeding like everything else. And then this is the inferior vena. Kiva coming back up. All right, this one is kind of explaining the different blood vessels, and I kind of drew it out here to look like. Um, so from the heart, here you have like arteries, and arteries tend to be, because this chapter is on blood vessels, so arteries tend to be large. They tend to fit lots of, um, lots of blood. So this is like a like an interstate. That's how I kind of view it. So it fits a lot of traffic, and the, that traffic can go really fast, right? So the blood that moves through an artery is going pretty fast. But then when these arteries get a little bit smaller and a little bit less numerous, they turn into arterioles. So arterioles, I view it like like Paris Road or something like that, like um, Judge Perez. And you could, you could go, you have to go a little bit slower. There's a little bit fewer lanes. And then you get to a residential street. And you see, like, the way I drew it, there's only one blood cell at a time that's going on these residential streets. And that's kind of like a capillary. Well, a capillary is kind of like a residential street. And then these blue boxes I drew here, I guess in this analogy, they're houses, but they're here it's like they're cells, so you're trying to oxygenate the cells. And so each of these like red dots is like a blood cell that's oxygenated. And then as you see, I did a couple ones that were purple where they're kind of oxygenated but kind of not, and then it, turned, it turns blue as it's going towards a vein. And there it's, it's deoxygenated blood. So I try to like color code it. Is it, it's not working? I'm not letting you. Yeah, there you go. Just mute your... Um... So... So... These blo these boxes out here, this is like the, um, these are the cells. And then in between the cells, we call it interstitial fluid. So like this space, like I'm with my cursor right now, the space in between these cells, it'd be like the, like the, the backyard and the driveway and the lawn, that would be interstitial fluid. So this is a capillary, the smallest vessel is a capillary, and then right outside the capillary, interstitial fluid. So that's kind of like the layout. So you have an artery that's leaving the, the heart, and then it goes to an arterial, and then it goes to a capillary. So artery, arterial, capillary. Then on the way back to the heart, 
venial vein, and then it's going to become a some you know the vena cava. So really, we got like five new vessels or five vessels that we're going to discuss in this lecture: artery, arterial, capillary, and then venial and vein. So venial is like a little blood vessel like the size of the capillary, but it's on its way back to the heart. So it's like a little vein. Just like a capillary is a really little artery, a venule is a little vein. This is kind of showing all the venous return to the heart, right? And all, all these veins end up in the either the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava. Same thing here. This is all the blood flow out, right? So this is the aorta. It drops down behind the heart. This is all the, this is going to become all the arteries, right? So from here, this branches off into the arteries. And a lot of these arteries are named after the bones. For example, um, the one right here by your femur is ephemeral, tibial, things like that. Subclavian by your clavicle. Uh, so they're all, they're all, a lot of these, not all of them, but a lot of these have names similar to the bones. So now we move to the, the artery itself, and the artery is labeled here A. And so it's, they've got different, an artery has different things in it and different thicknesses. So you see like the vein is a lot thinner than an artery. So the artery has three coats or like three layers, right? So these coats are called tunica. So if you notice here, it says tunica interna, tunica media, tunica externa. So tunica interna is like the most internal one. I could sit next to you if you want. If it's, I mean, I could, I don't know why I'm up here. I could sit anywhere. Tunica externa is the is the main one. It's like the, the, the outer one. Tunica media is in the middle. <clears throat> so let's look at the tunica interna, the, the most internal layer. So I'm looking right here. And then there's this basement membrane one. This is super weird to be sitting right next to you guys and just and then there's this white Swiss cheese looking thing. So that's elastic. So we got three layers here. This most inner layer is epithelial epithelial tissue. That most internal one. So it's we in the blood vessel we call it endothelium, but it's epithelial tissue. And epithelial tissue is usually attached to a basement membrane. So we have epithelial tissue attached to a basement membrane, and then here's a layer of elastic. That's your tunica interna. Epithelial tissue attached to a basement membrane, attached to a thin layer of elastic. The middle layer, that's kind of like the important layer. It has a layer of muscle and a layer of elastic. And if you look at this one up here, the layer of muscle is kind of thick and the layer of elastic is rather thin. All right, but on some of arteries, it's reversed. The layer of muscle is thin and the, this layer of elastic is thick. So now we're talking about this middle layer. So um, I'll get to that in a second. And then the tunica externa is just uh, connective tissue, like no big deal. Uh, we'll get to veins later. We'll come back to that. So this is just looking at an artery. You got the first three layers here. And then you got two layers as the tunica media. And then you got one layer as the tunica externa. Well, I was saying earlier that there's two types of arteries. <clears throat> 
So we call them elastic and muscular arteries, or another word is conducting and distributing arteries. So that one that we see in this slide here, this is a muscular artery. Because if you're looking at this middle layer, the muscle's rather thick and the elastic's rather thin. If it were reversed, it would be the, an elastic artery where the elastic layer's thick and the muscle's thin. And so if you think about, you gotta like think about what they're, um, what they're doing. Arteries that are closer to the heart you do not want to constrict them because when you're constricting them, you're going to back up all the blood in the heart. So there's no need to have thick layers of muscle. In fact, you want a thick layer of elastic because the blood is surging out of the heart and into the artery. So the ventricles contracting, pushing the blood into the, into the artery so it needs to expand out. So that's why they're elastic. But if you think about an artery in the leg, that's further away from the heart. That will be a muscular artery because maybe like, uh, for example, if, you, if you're in shock, right? And if, you're, if your blood is, if you're, if you're not getting, if you're not oxygenating your blood, right? You're in shock, really low blood pressure. Well, you can contract the muscle in those arteries in your arms and legs, and you could divert that blood back to, like, the core of your body. Well, let's say you, you get in a car accident and you're bleeding, like, in your leg. You, you know, you could, the, the muscular arteries can constrict that muscle and slow down blood flow. So, like, this artery would be something that I would expect in a leg is you want a thick layer of muscle. But next to the heart, like in the subclavian artery, it wouldn't be like this because you're not going to constrict a, a blood vessel so close to your heart. You're not going to constrict an artery so close to your heart. So anyway, those are two types of arteries, elastic and uh, muscular, or in other words, con conducting and distributing. And it, the difference between them is the tunica media. That's it, that middle layer. This is showing you an arterial, and we're not gonna, there's no need for me to talk about the layers. What an arterial does is that it slows, it slows the blood flow down. Because this blood, it, it slows the flow and it, and it lowers the pressure. Because this blood's going to be in a capillary. You can't have the same pressure in an artery as a capillary. So you have like this intermediate blood vessel called an arterial. Arterials have some muscle in them. And they also have a little bit of elastic. But there's muscle. They are able to constrict. And so... Um, So what? So yeah, they, you, you want to you want to really drop that pressure down before it gets into a capillary. Capillaries cannot handle high pressure, um, but arteries do. So if you think about like a residential street versus an interstate, right? You, people are going to be on a residential street in front of your house. They can't be going seventy-five. You can't have three lanes going in each direction. You've got to transition. You've got to make a transition. So the arterial is like Judge Perez or something. You know, you get off of the interstate and you've got to slow down. And then you see capillary. All these are capillaries. And so you see how they're kind of different colors. There's like red. Then there's like a purplish layer and then blue. So the capillary, these are like, we call them capillary beds. They're not, it's like, where's the line between oxygenated and deoxygenated blood? There's no line. It's just... If the cell needs the oxygen, it's going to take it from the blood. And so as oxygen leaves the blood, we go from like this, we go to like this purple area and like this blue area. Not that these things are really this color. It's just that we use it in the book. They're showing you here. So here's an arterial. And then here's, this is going to feed all the capillaries. 
And they're showing you that that if they really need to, if your body needs to, it can shut it can shut the capillaries off. So it can close these. They're called precapillary sphincters. They can close these gates and just not give any oxygen to your tissue. And now they're sending all this blood straight to the venule, and that's going to go straight to the vein and back to your heart. So this would be an example like if you were in shock, if your blood pressure was really low. That's essentially what shock is. Your blood pressure is really low. Then you're going to try to divert blood, and you want to keep it over by your heart. Like, you know, At that point, it's life-threatening, so you don't need to give blood to your arms and legs. You need to give blood to your heart and your brain and your lungs, but it's not that important to get them out to your fingers, right? So then something like this would happen. You can, your body can shut blood off and re-divert it and get it going back again to the heart. And then so we talked about two different types of arteries and they're like how the arteries have like these different coats, the, the tunics, tunica externa and tunica media. We didn't really talk about arterioles. The only thing that I was saying about them is that they slow down the blood flow or the, or, and they lower the pressure, right? But now we're in a capillary and there's tons of capillaries, right? You have miles and miles and miles, hundreds of miles of capillaries in your body, thousands of miles. Right. <clears throat> Some of them are so small that they only can fit one blood cell at a time. But we have different types of capillaries depending on where these capillaries are in your body. So what capillaries are made of? Um, they're essentially epithelial tissue and basement membrane. I mean, that's all capillaries really are. And so you're, you're looking here like here's one epithelial cell, here's another epithelial cell. So there's like three epithelial cells. There's three cells right here. And then there's like a basement membrane. That's kind of all they are. So they're very simple. There's no muscle. There's no elastic. There's not a lot to them. It's just epithelial tissue. Or in this case, we call it endothelial tissue, but it's the same thing. So right here, this type of capillary is called a continuous capillary. So this is one of the things that you should know that you're going to need to know is like the types of capillaries. Right? So continuous capillary, there's not a lot of space. You can already see the differences, right? Like this one over here has lots of holes in it. This one doesn't really have so many holes. This has a few more, right? That's the difference, right? So the only place here that things can leave the capillary or go into the capillary the only way you're going to enter or exit is in between you got to fit in between these two epithelial cells so we call those the intercellular cleft it's written right here so intercellular cleft You got something you can see? Oh, you're looking. All right, I'm going to move. Okay. So I don't give you guys. Right. Oh. The intercellular cleft right here, that's what, that's what they can move through. And then you look at these other types, there's a little bit, there's more spaces. There's like all these pores in the, in the capillary. So these are called fenestrations. It means like windows. So there's all these pores in the capillary. So now there's a little bit more space for things to move in or out. So maybe something, maybe a gland that made like a hormone or something, the, the capillaries around it would be more like this. All right, this first one, continuous, that might be like, okay, like in your brain, I would expect to find these types of capillaries, right? Next to your thyroid gland or something like that, this, this secrete stuff. I would expect to find this because you need to get stuff in and out of your blood at a higher rate, right? If your, your body's making a hormone, you want to get that hormone into your blood. And if you look at this one over here, sinusoid, 
the intercellular clefts are huge and the fenestrations are huge. You would find that like, in fact, some of these are so big that you can get a blood cell in and out. So you can take a whole red blood cell and push that red blood cell out. So if you think about what in your body, what in your body deals with blood cells? What part of your body deals with red blood cells? From what you know about red blood cells. There was a quiz question on it. Red bone marrow. You would find sinusoid capillaries in your red bone marrow. Because the red bone marrow makes red blood cells, right? And then after you make the red blood cell, how do you get that into the blood? You push it through here. Or the liver or the spleen. The liver and the spleen eat up all the old red blood cells, right? So in your liver, I would expect to find these types of capillaries. Because you're trying to get a whole blood cell out of it. So those are the three types. Continuous, fenestrated, sinusoid. Um, Fenestrated have fenestrations. Sinusoid have big fenestrations, big intercellular clefts. Not really the way to describe it. All right. So far, any questions? So what I want you to what I what I probably would want you to know up to this point are muscular versus distributing arteries right there at this slide. So what are the two types of arteries that you could find in the in the body? And then three types of capillaries. Okay. Now we're going to talk about stuff moving in a capillary or out of a capillary because we have fluid and other things that always are moving in or out of a capillary. This is by two. So if stuff moves out of a capillary, we call that filtration. So I'm kind of underlining the word here. In fact, I might have a slide on this. I do right here. So I've already got this written down. Filtration is when things leave a capillary. Reabsorption is when fluids move back, back into a capillary. So exiting a capillary, filtration. Reabsorption is entering a capillary. To use the house analogy, we're talking about leaving the residential street and moving into your lawn and driveway of the house, where your house is. That's filtration. Taking your car and driving it from the street into your driveway and onto your front lawn, that's filtration. Reabsorption is the opposite. When you take your car off the front lawn, you shouldn't be on the lawn, but off the front lawn and move it into the driveway and then go onto the street again, that's reabsorption. The driveway in your front lawn is interstitial fluid. See, I've got it written, this word written here, interstitial fluid. That's the stuff outside of the capillary. So we have different pressures. There's different reasons to force fluid out of a capillary, or you can force fluid into a capillary. So the first thing that's going to force fluid out of a capillary is your heart, your heart beating. Every time your heart beats, it puts pressure on your blood. So that's blood hydrostatic pressure. It's just blood hydrostatic pressure is just is blood pressure. The fact that your blood vessels have some pressure in them that pushes fluid out. So that's a push factor, but there's also like a pull factor. And so we're using albumin here. So just like water follows sodium, water follows albumin. Remember, albumin is one of the three plasma proteins. Mm -hmm. 
So when we put more albumin into the interstitial fluid, the water wants to go into the interstitial fluid with it. So it wants to leave the capillary. So when you have more albumin in the interstitial fluid, water leaves the capillary. And the reverse is true. If you put more albumin in the blood, the water will go into the capillary. So water goes wherever the albumin is. And your body, your, your blood, your, your capillaries, your body moves albumin in and out of your capillaries all the time. It uses that to get water in and out of your capillaries. And then you, that's why you see these words, interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. That just means you have a lot of albumin in your interstitial fluid, and that's creating like a pull pressure, like a sucking pressure, it's pulling water out of your, out of your capillary. And that same sucking pressure, it could work in the opposite direction. So more albumin in your blood, that's going to suck the fluid into your blood vessels, into your capillaries. So if somebody's like got like a super swollen foot, for example, like you have edema, that's because a lot of the fluids left the blood and gone into the interstitial fluid, and that's why it's all swollen up. Right? So you could... You could give somebody albumin, like increase the albumin in their blood. You can give them like a shot of albumin, and that would start to suck the fluid back into the blood and make the swelling go down. And what you'd be doing in that case, if you give a shot, you'd be doing the blood colloid osmotic pressure. You'd be increasing the albumin in their blood, and then that's going to start sucking the, the fluid back into the capillary. So the words are harder than the ideas. Interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, blood colloid osmotic pressure. All that is saying is, where are you putting the albumin? Are you putting it in the blood? Then you're gonna have reabsorption. Putting it into the interstitial fluid, you're gonna have filtration. So that's what this slide is showing. So your book is gonna talk about two pressures for filtration and one pr two pressures for reabsorption. If you notice this slide, I put two pressures for filtration and I only put one pressure for reabsorption because the other one that your book might talk about is a bunch of BS. It doesn't have any effect. I don't even know why they put it. In fact, I even think on this slide, although I can't really see it, let me put my glasses on. Yeah, it's 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 negligible it's like nothing all right anyway so <clears throat> do you guys know the difference between filtration and reabsorption i hope so but let me know if you don't fluid leaving the capillary is filtration fluid going back into the capillary reabsorption Reabsorption is kind of a weird word, but when you hear it with a body, it kind of means that you're going to keep things. For example, if the kidneys are reabsorbing things, just think in your head, okay, that means we're going to keep it and not, and not pee it out. That's at least how I look at it. So what are the pressures driving filtration and what, what are the pressures driving filtration and reabsorption? Oh, look at the weather outside. Is that just the window tint? No. It is dark. It's got to be the tent. Yeah, you guys aren't going anywhere. It's like yesterday. Margaret Orr is going to be doing overtime again. Oh my God. That overtime pay. 
Um, all right, this slide is showing you how much the pressure drops. So pressure, how do we, we measure pressure in millimeters of mercury. That's what's written on the side here. You see how it says like pressure and then MMHG? That's what MMHG stands for. I'm gonna mute one of you guys. Yes, I can. It's it's me half the time. I I I do it all the time. The worst part is like when you're muted, when you're not muted and you think you're muted and then, you know, you're not paying attention. So even when you're paying attention, you're not paying attention. So then when someone else comes in, you'll like talk to them or something. That is, that's the stuff I do all the time. I'll be like, no, nah, that's all right. This meeting sucks anyway. I'm not even paying attention. And I'm like unmuted. <clears throat> All right, um, so look at the pressures here. So this, we measure pressure just like blood pressure, right? When you get that thing 120 over 80 or whatever we say, that's millimeters of mercury. We don't use the, we don't use the mercury anymore, but at one time that's, you know, that's where it comes from. So anyway, we measure it in millimeters of mercury. That's how we measure pressure. Um, when it's coming out of the heart, in fact, this is too low. It's really somewhere around 100. So uh, coming out of the heart is somewhere around 100 millimeters of mercury. But look at the pressure of blood in your veins. We are down to like 10. So there's a huge drop. You're going from like 100 to 10. Right? So here, like this red line, why is the red line going up and down, up and down? Well, they're telling you right here. Systolic blood pressure. Every time your heart... Every time your ventricle contracts, there's like a surge of blood coming out of your heart. And in your, in your artery, that's, uh, the pressure is going to go up. So actually, when you take blood pressure, you're, you're putting the cuff usually on the brachial artery, like up in your arm. And then every time, so the systolic, the top number is the pressure on your artery wall when the ventricles contract. And then the bottom one is, what's the pressure on your artery wall when the ventricles relaxed? In fact, we really, we don't need both ventricles because one ventricle is going to the lungs. So we're not even measuring that one. So which ventricle are we measuring? There's only two. Left or right, it's a 50-50 shot. One of these is gonna go to the lungs. One of these is going to go to the rest of your body. The left ventricle. Yeah, so we're measuring the left ventricle. So when they put the blood pressure cuff on your arm, they're measuring every time your left ventricle contracts, what is the pressure in that artery where the cuff is? And then every time the ventricles relaxed, what is the pressure in that artery? So you're seeing here, it's like oscillating. It's going, they're showing it between like whatever, 120 and 80. That's just kind of a number. It doesn't really, but so we'll average it out and say it's around 100, right? So coming out of your heart's around 100. So here we are, aorta, arteries. Here's like the artery in your arm where they take blood pressure. Then you get to arterial, it takes a dive, right? And there's different reasons for that, but one of the reasons is it's a smaller vessel. So smaller vessel, just think of like going from a freeway and getting off, going on the cloverleaf and getting on to read. You got it? You got to slow down, right? You, have, you can't do 80 anymore. There's stoplights. There's, there's only two lanes now, not three. Right? That's, that's what an arterial does. And so it really lowers the pressure down, right? And then when you get to a capillary, it's dropped down to like 20. You have to have it like that because you're going to blow your capillaries out if you try to put 
40 millimeters of mercury or 50 millimeters of mercury into a, into a capillary. Sometimes you'll see it happens to people's eyes. You'll see like these little pinpoint hemorrhages in people's eyes. And then, I mean, I don't think this is, I don't know how true it is, but they say, oh, it's like maybe a stroke. So it drops down a lot. <clears throat> what does that mean? But then, that's all right. We have another problem here though. Look at the pressure in the veins. So it's down to like 10, right? Then we gotta get, we gotta get that blood back to the heart, right? So in your head, okay, that's fine because we got gravity on our side, right? And it goes down the jugular vein and it goes to your, back to your heart. So that's not a problem. Getting, this, getting, getting the blood into your vena cava, your superior vena cava is probably not too difficult. But what about the inferior? So you've got your veins in your legs and the pressure of blood is like 10. So it's like really difficult. How do you get that blood to get back to your heart with, uh, you know, with such a low pressure? Oh, okay. So, and before we talk about how that happens, this is just the, what I was saying earlier, your blood pressure, systolic versus diastolic. So when you're getting those numbers, when you're taking a blood pressure and you're getting those numbers, what do the numbers mean? <clears throat> when you guys are nurses, you're going to be probably making it up most of the time anyway. I know it sounds horrible, but you'll... You'll think of me, you'll think of me when you make it up. You're supposed to take it every hour and you're going to take it like once and then you're going to be like, oh, because you're at your nurse's station talking and you don't want to leave because the room's like 20 feet away. So you're going to be like, um, 118 over 72. You'll have, you'll even have your respiratory rate that you have that you, you always use. Respiratory rate 16. Really, again, 16? Never changes? So anyway, um, that's what blood pressure is. And um, thank God for um, thank God for the digital machines that are not as accurate. I think they're more accurate because what's not accurate is someone taking it the old way, because I know they're not even listening. They got the stethoscope. But you see their eyes are watching the mercury bounce or they're watching the needle bounce. So they're not even like loosening. Like you see where they have the, um, where they have that part of the stethoscope. It's not even like, anyway, I know it's not accurate. And they're like, oh good, 120 over 80. Really? What a coincidence because that is like the standard number that people give. And you just, and I just happen to have that blood pressure. Um, but you know, now the machines, they just do it for you. So mean arterial pressure. Um, you know what? I don't care if you know this, <clears throat> so you don't have to memorize mean arterial pressure, but it's, you take your systolic and you take your diastolic. So systolic would be like, let's say if we're using like the regular numbers, 120, and then you take two times your diastolic. So 80 times two is like 160. So you take 120 and you add it to 160 and then you divide it by three. That's just another, that's just another way to do it. It, it accounts for, cause like you can have like, <clears throat> let's say you have a blood pressure of um, 110 over 90, 110 over 80 or 105 over 78 or whatever, right? So. Those numbers are both like good numbers in the sense that they're under this magic number of 120 over 80. They're so like, oh, well, that's a good blood pressure, but the numbers are closer together. So that's not good either. Or the numbers could be far apart, like further apart than, than like 40, right? So mean arterial pressure kind of 
get to that a little bit more. <coughs> they use it a lot, but. All right, so resistance, what, what is opposing blood flow? <coughs> What's slowing blood flow down? You looked at that other photo and it showed how by the time you get to an arterial blood pressure, the pressure starts to drop a lot. Why? These are the reasons. The lumen, as the lumen, you know, the, the, the diameter of the blood vessel, as it gets smaller, blood, vessel, blood, blood um, resistance goes up a lot, which means pressure goes down. And it's not like, you know, if you make the lumen half the size, resistance goes up times two. It's not like that. See, I'm putting here times 16. So it's like exponential. They've got a word for it. I don't know what it is. I'm calling it exponential. I hate all that crap because it involves math. And just like when you guys get to respiratory, there's a lot of math in there. And there's the same idea. But that's one reason. The length of the blood vessels. So uh, it's 400 miles or let's say well, it's like 200 kilometers, 250 kilometers for every kilogram of adipose tissue. I tried to convert it. So, you know, for every one pound of fat, there's 250 miles of capillaries. But again, these capillaries are super small, but the more capillaries you have, the, 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 the longer the blood vessel, the more resistance. And then viscosity is the thickness of the blood. So having a, um, having like a really high hematocrit might influence, would influence blood viscosity, and then that's going to influence resistance. Right? It doesn't move as, as, as well. And the pressure is going to go down. But when you have thicker blood, pressure goes down. When you have more blood vessels, pressure will drop in those other vessels. When your pressure drops in these vessels, what does your heart have to do? You're trying to get oxygen to your, your feet and the pressure, you have like a traffic jam in your arms. You're trying to get all those cars to your hands to give them oxygen. The oxygen is like the people, and then the cars are like the red blood cells. So there's a traffic jam. What does your heart have to do? Yeah, it's got to step it up. Yeah, it's got to beat faster, harder. It's got to step its game up because it's trying to push that through that. Trying to get it going. Which is what, which is what you don't want. So, um, you don't have to know it. I mean, I mean, I've just got a slide on it, but I'm not going to ask you about veins. But just know that veins, veins have um, they're a little bit different. They have like the, the three tunicas, tunica interna. Here they're calling it tunica intima. Wherever I got this slide, I don't remember. But tunica intima, tunica interna, same thing. Tunica interna, tunica media, tunica externa, but they're a little bit different here. For example, you don't see muscle here. Right? You don't need muscle. They're not, you're not constricting veins. The pressure is too, the, well, the pressure is low, first of all. So constricting it wouldn't really do anything. You don't see a lot of elastic. Again, pressure is low. You don't need, you don't need a bunch of elastic here. You're just trying to, blood, blood flows through a vein, but blood pulsates through an artery. So if you cut a vein, blood oozes out. If you cut an artery, you would know it. It, it shoots out. Like it goes four or five feet. It's kind of like on, it's kind of like on, TV on horror movies. I mean, I've never seen someone's chopped off head, but I've seen it come out of people's arms a lot, and it, it spurts like that, right? It, it, it pulsates, but the vein, the, but the venous blood 
it just kind of oozes out. So we have this blood in the um, in the legs, and it's really low pressure. Again, the pressure is like 10 millimeters of mercury. We got to get that blood up to the up to the up to the heart. So our body has some ways to kind of help that process along. And one is the skeletal muscle pump. So if we go back and look at veins, you notice that there's valves. There's one-way valves in the veins. That's to keep the blood, especially in your legs, that's to keep the blood flowing in one direction. So once the blood passes this valve, you don't want it turning around and dropping back down your leg. This is what causes like varicose veins, like variceal, the valves, the valves get screwed up and like blood backs up and it kind of bulges the vein out. <clears throat> so these are your calf muscles. And every time you take a step, those calf muscles squeeze this vein and push the blood up. I'll start this way. Push the blood up past the valve. Then when you take a step, like when you lift your foot and those muscles aren't contracting, then the blood tries to flow back, but the valves keep it from going back. And then when you take your next step, it pushes the blood a little further up. So every time you're like walking, that's helping to push the blood up past the next valve, past the next valve. So you're, you're, the skeletal muscle pump is helping to push blood up your um, up your legs. The other one, I'm not moving backwards. The other one's called the respiratory pump. So if you look at this guy on the right side, the the greenish color is your thorax and the reddish color is your abdomen. So it's like the bottom of your breastbone, right? And so this is the diaphragm, and the diaphragm is shaped like this it's not flat so in its normal its resting point it's it's curved it's curved up All right so the diaphragm is a muscle this diaphragm is going to be responsible for you breathing so whenever you breathe the diaphragm is going to contract so look on the left side the diaphragm is flattened down it's contracted that's going to make you breathe it's not like you breathe in and the breathing in flattens out the diaphragm or contracts it. It's the opposite. The diaphragm contracts, that's gonna cause you to breathe in. But the other point is when the diaphragm contracts, you see how it's getting pushed down? It pushes all your guts. So it's pushing on like your liver and your stomach and all your stuff in your abdomen. It's pushing all that up against the inferior vena cava right here. So every time you breathe in, when your diaphragm contracts, it's pushing up against the inferior vena. It's making all your guts push up against the inferior vena cava. And that's pushing blood up towards your heart. So the respiratory pump's also helping get blood up. So those are two mechanisms we have. See how many slides more I have. Uh, I'm wondering if I should just carry this one more day. I think I am. So from today, let me go back to the beginning. Things that I would ask you about on a future test. Uh, two types of arteries. So I've got it written out here. Three types of capillaries. And what's the difference between them? Just in your own words. Well, Here's some stuff to talk about. The, the continuous have only the intercellular cleft. So I got this, that words right down here. It only has the intercellular cleft. That's the only way things can get in and out. 
that's continuous. Fenestrated, the, the intercellular clefts are, are larger. And you have those pores. So there's like two ways to get things in and out. And then the sinusoid, you just take the stuff that you wrote for fenestrate, fenestrated and you put like large or big or huge behind it. Huge fenestrated clefts, huge, I'm sorry, huge intercellular cleft, huge fenestrations. Take whatever you put for fenestrated and you just, you say even bigger. <clears throat> so that's a question. So we've got two so far. One, two, three. Filtration and reabsorption. What are the pressures driving filtration and reabsorption? Explain the pressures driving filtration and reabsorption. Yeah, and the words are harder than what it is. Like what's driving filtration? Well, your regular, your blood pressure from your heart. You don't have to say pressure generated from ventricular contraction. All I'm saying there is, is pressure from your heart. And then interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, you could just say there's, there's albumin in the interstitial fluid that's pulling it out. Just like salt pulls fluid out of something, right? It's the same idea. Albumin. Remember, albumin is one of your plasma proteins. And then you put, you put like what I was telling you guys to put, was transport, right? Albumin is for transport. This is how they do it. Because you move albumin around and that, that takes the fluid out of your capillaries, or it can put the fluid in your capillaries. Reabsorption, what about it? Well, you could just say that there's like more albumin in the blood. A colloid is just a mass of something. And so here they're saying, what's a colloid? It's a mass of albumin. Where's the albumin? In the blood. So it's like blood albumin pressure. Osmotic just means water, like diffusion of water. Osmosis is like the movement of water. All right, so all this word is saying is that there's albumin in the blood and it's making the water move. But the word is harder than the than act what it actually does. That was number three. Yeah, that was three. Uh, four. What what blood pressure? And there's really, I mean, there's really no easier way. You know, the, the pressure on the wall of your artery when the heart contracts, when the ventricle contracts. Diastolic's the opposite. Pressure on the arterial wall when the ventricle relaxes. It'd be nice if you knew what the two numbers meant when you take a blood pressure or when you fake taking a blood pressure. By the way, the arms are not the only place you could take blood pressure. Like you could take it wherever. You could take it in the forearm. What was that? Leg. leg. Yeah. Take it in the leg. Sometimes people have like uh, they'll have like they'll have IVs in one arm and then the other arm they have a shunt, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't fight. You work at dialysis? You ever seen those things blow? Then you see like the arterial blood. And you what? It like, like if I'm here, it's like going on the screen. Yeah, it's like shooting out. And the dialysis you find? No, well, the dialysis they have like those 
like those ports that you just hook up to. I just know to feel people form, like certain people, I'm going to feel their arm because if you put like the blood pressure cuff on them and it squeezes down on it, yeah, you don't want to like. And usually they're older and there's like, you know, the arm's not, it's just, you know, there's not like a lot of muscle and stuff there. So it's like this resistance. And blood viscosity is thickness. I didn't put that down there, but, and I don't, I don't care. Like, I don't need you to put half diameter 16 times resistance. I just want you to know as the lumen gets smaller, resistance goes up. That's the only thing I cared about. And same thing with the length of the vessels. As you get more vessels, uh, resistance goes up. Yeah. Blood viscosity, as the blood gets thicker, the resistance goes up. I don't care about the 250 miles of capillaries. I was just giving you an example. I don't even know how right that is. I mean, it's around there. It's hundreds of miles. Resistance goes up. Resistance. Yeah, you know what? Just think about like ketchup in a ketchup bottle, right? And if you put, if you fill it half with water and shake it up, and then you squeeze the ketchup bottle, it's coming out like a lot faster. I don't know why I thought of that stupid example. What's that? Yeah, smaller lumen. Longer vessels, thicker blood. It all makes it go up. As the lumen gets smaller, the resistance goes up. Yeah. There's hard, you know, it's harder to get in there. It's like when they take traffic and they cut off one of the lanes and everyone's got to go into like one fewer lane. Like what happens right there? That's, that's resistance. What happens? Everybody moves slower. Um, I don't know how I'm going to ask a question on this, so I'm not going to do it or this because I don't, I don't know what, I don't know how we can, ex I don't know. It's just not a, so there is, so that's it. So, so that's it so far. And then next class we'll, I'll talk about, um, control of blood pressure. Well, anyway, we'll talk about that stuff later. I'll talk about this one, control of blood pressure. This looks similar to a question you already had. It is similar. So it's just very slight differences, but yes, yeah, so you already know that. And then we'll talk about shock and that's shock, hypoperfusion shock and how we, what we can do about it and stuff like that. So, all right. Sorry about the mess up today. I really had it all set up so that we could just start lecture at 10. We, we wasted a bunch of time, but they're going to fix that problem. I'll see you guys later. If you don't have any questions. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Oh, I gotta stop recording too.